they did that in a weekend in the garage. Um, I'm Kirk Thatcher, I'm moderating, that's all you're gonna hear about me. Um, next to me is executive producer, Allie Stanford, president of Jim Henson Television. We have the three co-executive producers and writers, Javier Grillo Narkswatch, Will Matthews, and Jeff Addis. We have the two guys responsible for supervising the build and the creation of the characters, Peter Brook, head of the Creature Shop at Jim Henson Company, Toby Froud. And we have two of the performer puppeteers, Alice Deneen and Victor Yeri. All right, settle down, quiet now. We got a lot to cover in 25 minutes. All that, 10, 10 hours of television. All right, so I'm gonna start with Hallie, who started development of the project with the Jim Henson Company. Hallie, take it away. I will take it away. I do wanna say that 25 years ago, I feel like the whole reason we're all up here is because this guy hired me as his writer's assistant. I just had to do the shout out. And I was taking orders from here two weeks later. Yeah, exactly. So um, this is a dream come true to be here, especially up on this panel. It's my son Theo's first Comic-Con, so it's pretty special. Um, but to talk about Dark Crystal, everybody up here is a massive fan of the property. Uh, I grew up with it as a little kid and I loved it, so my job as president of television and executive producer is to make and sell television, but a dream, dream, dream was to create a prequel series of The Dark Crystal. So in doing that, and I went to Lisa Henson and said, we should do this, we should create this series. Where do we begin? Well, it was pretty easy to figure out where to begin. We had the wonderful movie, but also Brian Froud had created this book called The World of, Brian, of the Dark Crystal by Brian Froud. And it had all this history of the mystics and the Skeksis and the world, and it just started to spark our imagination. And so Lisa and I decided to put together a giant world building brainstorming session. And we called it the Great Creative Conjunction. And if you don't know what that means, watch the movie, you'll learn all about the uh, uh, Great Conjunction. And so at that session, we brought in uber fans, we brought in Boom Archaea Comics, we brought in writers, we brought in The Creature Shop, we brought in Brian Froud, which was amazing. And we sat there and we worked on what is this world, what did it look like before the darkening? When, what was it like when there were more than two Gelfling? And we just started to unpack it. And we even like would look at things like the Wall of Destiny, which is something from the original film. And we'd see in it that like in the Wall of Destiny, there was a female Gelfling who was wearing a crown. And we thought, oh my gosh, what if this was a matriarchy and women ran this world? So we're like, yeah, we're gonna do that. And so then we built out the seven clans, we built out the Skeksis, we built out the Mystics, and we felt like we had this very rich, vibrant prequel thra. And then from that, we dug into developing the television series. And so we were very, very lucky to work with these three to come in and figure out what is that show? How do we make it? And grateful to Netflix for saying, go and make a puppet series of The Dark Crystal. Let's do it like the original. So very exciting. Um, so I feel like that that's my quick you know, well, I want to ask, 20, what, in the 25 minutes. to introduce these three guys, yes. what had they worked on that made you go, these are the guys? Uh, well, Javier and I had worked uh, when we were, when we were uh, only... Tweens. Tweens, yes, <laughs> tweens. We were really tweens on uh, one of our first projects together um, in the beginning of our careers, uh, a project called the Van Helsing Chronicles. And, um, and so it was... a. Uh, something that we both felt very strongly about coming back. I'll let him tell about when he first heard about it. I don't want to take that story away from him. But Will and Jeff are such Uber fans, and they came in, and they'll tell their story too, but they came in, coming in hard to pitch a Labyrinth series, but instead we surprised them and said, hey, actually, we're looking to develop a Dark Crystal series. Do you have any ideas? And they certainly did, and this is the show that they created. So, so then you guys all met. And they gave you this book of materials they come up with, or all the ideas, and then you took it from there? Well, I want to go on record as saying these guys did all the heavy lifting. Like, I came in after the show had been ordered, so I was really easy because they're so good. I was like, all right, I don't know, let's do that, you know? So my job was actually made quite easy by, by you guys. Maybe you should talk about how you put the show, you know, put, put your concept together. We had been drinking, and we came up with an idea for a Labyrinth sequel. And so we called Henson, and they said no. And they said, what about Dark Crystal? And we said, heck yes. So we came in to pitch what we thought was a sequel movie. We got it wrong a lot. And they were like, uh, it's a prequel TV show. And we said, great, we'll come back in a day or two. 
And we did, and that's and that was the genesis of, of the show. So we get handed a lot of material, a lot of brilliant artwork, a lot of uh, development material from other shows. There was the books tried. by J. M. Lee. That there, were I mean, coming comics. Out. I mean, there was just so much material of the thirty-five. The years. scrolls. And our job was to take all those pieces and build a new whole. And so we had some inherited characters. Mm. We had created some new characters, and that was the fun and the challenge of working with such a beloved and long-lived property, was finding a new path through this garden. But I remember the d naming Hup upstairs in our in my office at home came from us <laughs> walking around. He's like, you know, he's a little guy. He's just like, hey, yo, hey, yo, Hup, oh, Hup, Hup, Hup. And that became the name. And Brea was actually, and we've never said this before. Oh, you're going to say it? Is named no, after, don't say it. This is a secret. <laughs> is named after the street that the Henson Studios is on, which is La Brea. Um, we never said that because we were afraid they'd make us change it. Uh, <laughs> do we, do we want to talk about the two pop culture references we snuck into the show? Uh, we'll come back to that. We'll come oh, back to that, okay. All the secrets are coming <laughs> There's out. There's more than two. Yeah, no. uh, yeah and, and so they did all that heavy lifting. They, they wrote an amazing script, and I had just finished ruining The Hundred, and then I had ruined The Shannara Chronicles, and I was trying to ruin Xena. Uh, but I, I failed at ruining Xena, apparently, and, uh, and uh, I got a call to come into Jim Henson. The call was literally, hey, there's a job at the Jim Henson company, and I'm like, great, what is it? And they're like, can't tell you. I'm like, why? They're like, top secret Netflix thing. I'm like, all right. So I go to the Jim Henson company, I walk into a room, and there's Hallie and Lisa Henson and Blanca Lista, who uh, is uh, one of the feature executives at the company, and they literally handed me an NDA before they would tell me what it was. So I signed the NDA, and, and they give me an iPhone with a five-minute concept film that Louis Leterrier had directed to help sell the show to Netflix. And the moment that I realized it was The Dark Crystal, I... Opinions vary. I claim I kept it on the inside. Apparently, I did not. But, like, I Opinions literally... Opinions do not vary. Full, no. ugly man cry, apparently, in front of Lisa Henson. He did. He cried. Lost innocence, my childhood, all that stuff. And literally, they couldn't... Like, it was literally about... At that point, it was literally about whether the deal would close before they could get the restraining order. Um, and, uh, and that's how I became part of the show. Okay, so then the three of you are tasked with, now was there, was there an arc that you came up with? Like you know, main story points. Right, so the main story that the guys had taken from the very beginning and then just blown out was that, let, why, why now, like why this time now in the prequel of the series? And the why now is what would be the most interesting time in this, this particular time period? Well, how about when a Gelfling discovers that the Skeksis are bad and that they're draining the Gelfling? And so it started with that of one Gelfling who thinks, how can I possibly motivate a rebellion, a resistance, and does. And so we had Rihanna, our hero from the beginning, and of course we had Auburn, and all the mystics and Skeksis, but that's what we had in a world that was darkening, which feels very close to our world. So that's where it began, but from there, the guys took it from there. Well, as, as writers, as being one myself, you're, usually you're given the beginning, the idea, not the ending. So you're given the ending, you know where it ends, and you get kind of free reign, except for the characters that are existed to add and create these new characters. What was that process like? It was like, okay, we have this world, this amazing visuals, but we need to fill it with God, I don't know, well, there's 120 new, different characters. Yeah, I think there's something like 180 characters, creatures of the show. Yeah. Um, we came at it from solving a story problem, right? So each character was a way into the story. Whether it was uh, Brea at the top or Deep at the bottom, or Rian in the middle as a company man, that's where it started from. We were trying to ease the audience into a very dense, big, complicated world. So it was really about what function can they serve to help the story. And, and we knew from the beginning that the problem of a prequel is that you know the end, and in this case, the end can seem a little bleak. It's a bit and sad. So we, what with the death so we had the an company. answer for that. And so we went in to pitch Netflix, we pitched them the entire, what we thought would be the entire series, beginning, middle, and end. The end was very important to us to answer this question. Right. And then when they ordered the show and we wrote the pilot and we started moving forward, they said, eh, too much, cut it in half. So season one ended up being half of our pitch. But the good news is that if all of you watch the show diligently and the metrics are favorable, exactly. uh, whenever they tell us, we already know what happens in season two. It has been developed. It was part of their original pitch. So I'm just saying, if you have questions about how it ends and how we can get to that movie, which seems so bleak, but we're still we gonna make you happy. To tell Let you. it be on a never-ending loop. 
Yeah. 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 Yeah.
um, and the production designer was over in England. I, I met him Gavin, once. Yeah, you, Gavin, yeah. Gavin Bouquet was, was really quite incredible, actually. And he um, was involved early on. I remember he was. the sets weren't even built, and he had these amazing CG paintings. Yeah. And again, you were all in this big feedback loop, yeah. which again, a lot of people, especially in TV series, it's very much like a feature film, but you know, a 10 hour feature film. Um, I'll say the amazing thing of um, you know, building puppets and bringing them to the UK where we shot and then walking onto a uh, Skeksis hallway set. First day that Gavin and the team had built was amazing. Yeah. It was truly an experience. You could walk through the halls. Yeah. You could really walk. I got lost. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you could get lost in those halls actually. Yeah, we had 79 sets yeah. across two football fields. Yes. And all of our, a lot of our shops were there in the facility, so it was very much us for 10 months in these oh, buildings, yeah. in this world, in Thrawn. With the biggest amazing. grins on our faces. Okay, so now we're getting into production and walking the set. So we have two people here who yeah. did that for, what, 11 months? With your right hand up in the air? Yeah. <laughs> these are the two of the main performers, Alice and Victor. And uh, the fact that they drank, the fact that their right arm isn't twice times greater than their left arm always amazes me. So tell us who you played to start with, Alice. Uh, I played uh, I played uh, Brea the Gelfling, and also Madra Farah, and the Ornamentalist, and a number of uh, other little tiny creatures um, in cages and stuck to trees and different things. Dark crystal denizens. All right, and Victor, you played a character that has become beloved name. What was it? Hi, Kirky. Hi, Hi Kirky. Uh, you're talking about Hup? Yes. Yeah. Oh, there's Hup fans. Get tumble! So, and, and who was the other character? Because then you played a very dark, mean character. I got to do the Ritual Master, which right. was a mean Skeksis. Yes. And I got to do Kylan, who was a sweet Gelfling. Now, you guys auditioned for these characters, right? Did they just come in, or did they go, Alice, you're playing so-and-so, or was there a bit of an audition process? Uh, well, we got handed, uh, or emailed, um, this stack of unbelievable scripts. They were so good. They were so, I mean, just on the page, I just... So you got I, the job. You didn't stop auditioning. <laughs> they, they hired you. And, and I, I, I clicked and I opened the first one and I said, what's, what's the girl character going to be like? You know, which is sort of the default. You know, I knew I was going to be involved, but I, I, uh, and I started reading them and I thought, oh, oh okay, okay, I, I want to be, I want to be... I want to be Dean. I like this Dean character. Oh, but this Brea character is amazing. Oh, and this Celadon, she's the villain. And like one after another after another, there were these amazing characters. And eventually they, you know, they sorted it out as to who was most suited for which, but God, I would have been happy to do any of them. It, it, was, it, was, uh, it was just, a, it felt like an embarrassment of riches, not only to read the script, but also to walk onto the set, uh, walk in, see these, this childhood, uh, memory come to life. You could walk into it, you could walk through it, you could get lost in it. And uh, and then to be handed uh, these beautiful, beautiful physical creations, these puppets that we got to work with. It was just an incredible privilege. All right, speaking of puppets you got to work with, Victor, I, I'm told you brought a friend. Yeah, you want to see Kirky? Yeah, I'd like to see that. So this is the actual puppet. From Dark Crystal, Age of Resistance. It might take me ten or so minutes to get on. <laughs> That's good. They'll, we'll be walking off the stage at that point. <laughs> they're they're cutting us short for some reason, but <laughs> I think this will... Backstage in ten minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Hup! Yay! Okay! <laughs> Doza! Doza mean hello, Kirk. <laughs> That's, that's, I don't speak podling. Why, why, why not, Kirk? Because uh, I didn't work on the show. I didn't learn it. Kirk, you want to learn podling? I, I, I would be great, yeah. Okay, I'll teach you. I'll okay. teach you. Okay. Um, you can count, okay? I can. One, two, three. One, two, three. Eight day tray. Eight day tray. Four, five, six. Four, five, six. Oh, do tro. Oh, do tro. No, her, her big mistake. ED tree. ED tree. <laughs> A day tray, ED tree, ED oh, tree. Odo tro 789, sorry. Okay, you know what? Hop, hop podling a little rusty. You were not a mathematician, I'm imagining. So actually, I have a question about the podling language. As the writers, did you write some phonetic, or did somebody come up with a language? Jay, or? Jay, Jay, Jay and Lee. Lee has a master's in linguistics. But then, but then Victor would send emails in podling. Victor learned the whole language so well. He would send emails to, to, to J.M. Lee, he would be like, I don't know what you're saying. 
Victor memorized like the entire Pondering Dictionary. It was amazing. Yeah, well, it's tough. You know, you learn a language, you have to practice it, and there's nobody that speaks Pondering except <laughs> Joe and maybe Jeff a little. So I was just trying, I was just trying to learn. I only know the swear words. I remember those. You'll see that effort throughout the show. We are hoping that Pondering will overtake Klingon as the most widely spoken artificial language. So yeah. please join Klingon us. Klingon has had it too easy. I'll That's say. right. <laughs> All they have to fight against with Esperanto. Pondering. Come on, guys. <laughs> All right, well, we, they're, they're gesturing us for us to get Kirk, out. Kirk, let's rile stage. up crowd. <laughs> when I say dark, you say crystal. Dark. Crystal. Dark. Crystal. When I say second, you say season. Second. <laughs> second. Season. Second. Season. That's a great segue to the last question. Everyone asked, will there be a second season? And Holly said she would answer that question. Keep watching Netflix's tolls. They'll crunch the data. They're going to take a look at how everybody's looking at it. So hopefully we'll get one. And you guys keep watching. Tell your friends. Thank you, LA Comic Con. Holly Stanford, Javier Grillo, Mark Watch, Will Matthews, Jeff Addis, Pete Brook, Toby Frown, Pete Sines, Kirk Alice Green, and Hup. Thank you, everyone.